Hi and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma powered by Transform Performance International. Now, please, 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 you must now check out the YouTube channel. It's open and we are cranking through, must be about 50, 60 hours worth of back catalog. So subscribe to that so you are notified when these amazing episodes go live. Now on so many of these episodes, it's been a real privilege to talk to people about what does leadership mean? What is a leader? What's a leader in a sector, in an organization? And what does leadership mean to individuals? And that's really a conversation that we can have in this episode. Now, you don't want to miss this particular episode because we'll explore what does leadership actually mean on the international football field? And indeed, what are the lessons that we can bring across? So trust me, you do not want to miss this amazing episode where I have the wonderful Stuart Pierce come back to me just after this. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International, a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. So, Stuart, it's a huge warm welcome to the Leadership Medical. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's brilliant to be here. Well, there you go. After that intro, um, all about leadership, mm. and we will get into that. Um, there are so many stats that I could offer people. You know what? I wrote down a few, and I'll just share. And I know you've heard these all the time. But I kind of wanted just to, to start with some of these. 78 caps for England, mm. five goals two Euros, one World Cup. Uh, you have certainly played for amazing teams like Manchester City, Newcastle, West Ham, Nottingham Forest with two League Cups. So much more I could say in relation to that mm. background. But is there a real standout moment for you that is kind of stuck in your mind that always kind of floats to the surface when you think about the amazing things that you've done in your career? Um, probably um, because... My career, I, I never walked into the professional game um, and started off at an academy and it was a, a starlet from yep. a very young age, you know. I'd, I'd sort of had quite a fractured start as a youngster. Uh, didn't end up turning pro until I was 21. I'm a qualified electrician by yes. trade. And on that journey, uh, I was turned down for the Met Police, turned down for the Army, no qualifications to speak of at school, apart from a CSE Grade 1 at Social Studies, which... I'm still waiting for that to help me out in later life. Yeah. Um, so it was probably the journey and the initial sort of platform of the journey that, that I look at and think, well, to have the journey that I have in professional sport on the back of a work career, which has given me a real solid foundation, I think. Now, I didn't know that you'd actually had a go at joining the Metropolitan Police. Mm. So what was what was behind that? What was fueling that? I mean, you know, I spent six years yes, with them. So yeah. kind of what was behind that? At the time, it was a fantastic uh, career path for, for myself. You know, I, I was, um, I think it was 1978, I left school. Um, and it was really, what direction am I going to go? Uh, in, in qualification point of view, I wasn't sort of a high flyer. Uh, and... The Met was a real solid one for me. Um, unfortunately, I had two interviews lined up, one for the Army and one for the Met. Right. And I wish they had come in the opposite order they actually did. So I actually went for the Army interview first, spent a weekend down in Braintree. Right. Um, got to the uh, situation of Sunday evening in front of a commanding officer and I was blatantly too uh, honest from the offset and said, look, I've got an interview in two weeks for the Met Police. If I get that, I'll take that. If not, I'll join the army. <laughs> right. Which was an amateurish thing to say at the time. He he said, look, you know, there's there's people that have got more of a burning desire than yourself. So two weeks later, I went to Hendon, done yep. the same process oh, yeah. and got turned God, down by the Met. Now. Indeed. Wow, that's amazing. Listen, if, I always like, I love, Success leaves clues, and I'm mm. hearing clues already. Interesting. So you applied to the army and you applied to the Met. Yeah. Was there, in, in some ways, a desire for a life of service at that point? Because those are 
two careers that many would not subscribe to. Yeah. So was was there something going on there where you wanted to serve in some way? Yeah, I think so. I, th- I think structure. I've always liked structure in my life, I think. You know, when I look back now, um, I'm quite a structured person, yeah. you know, today as I was back then. Um, and probably in the 70s, both careers were really good careers. Yeah. You know, I think people view joining the police now with a, a little bit of trepidation. It has its challenges. Its challenges, you name it. Yeah. And maybe the military as well. With, with some of the conflicts we've seen as of recent times, you know, people are a little bit more reluctant. But at the time in the seventies, they were good career paths for someone leaving school, yeah. and uh, that's the way I looked at it. I certainly, um, a few years previous to that, I'd had a flirtation at Queens Park Rangers as a kid, five months there, and, right. and nothing come of that. So I was in a situation really that I knew I was going out to work and not a footballing career as such. So, at what point did football start to? maybe be a real career for you what do you think hang on this might be the direction of travel um really interesting for me i mean i i I left school at 16 and joined my local non-league team so i went down joined the youth team the reserves and broke into the first team at the end of that year i was offered a contract and they they offered me 15 pound a week first time (laughs) i'd ever been offered money to play football that's a result in itself isn't it exactly (laughs) that so so all of a sudden it sharpens your focus a little bit yeah um I sort of spent the uh, best part of four and a half, five years from that moment on. And as luck happens, dovetailed that with an apprenticeship on the local council as an electrician. So I finished my apprenticeship by six weeks. And then I was fortunate enough, word of mouth, got a manager at Coventry City to come down and look at me at Yeovil. Right. And uh, he'd come down, he watched, literally took his wife and... Uh, he watched the game for 45 minutes, saw enough of me in 45 minutes and said, I've found a left back. Wow. And rung the council. I, I packed my job in on the council on the Monday morning, went up to Coventry to, to agree a contract. Uh, he offered me £30 less than I was actually earning as an electrician and a part-time footballer. So right. To play in the top division in the country, by the way, the equivalent <laughs> of the Premier League. Oh, how things have so, changed. Oh, exactly <laughs> that. So... Obviously, I couldn't go back. I'd already resigned from the council. Um, so I took that and, and basically I'd never looked back in footballing terms from the age of 21, to be honest. I mean, what do you think that did for you, that you'd had some knockbacks? Yeah. You were looking at different careers. You yeah. qualified an electrician. Mm. You had that. Sometimes I find that you can be in the right place at the right time. There was a sweet spot of 45 minutes where yeah. you were seen and someone Indeed. said, that's my man. What had that done for you then as you then broke into the professional game? Was that... That, yeah. that set of experiences, what did you feel that gave you then to then take on the career of the footballer? Yeah, when I look back now, if I look back now to, to the age of 21 where yep. these things happened to me, I would turn around and say being rejected by my local football team that I supported, being rejected by two career paths, yep. uh, was it proved to me that I could handle resilience um, without a doubt. I, I think as well... Probably when I got to the age of 21, I look at, and, and I, I'd, I'd, I associate the word grit with myself and it's been used by commentators to yes. describe my performance. And when I looked up the meaning of the word grit, it was a combination of stamina and determination. Okay. And that probably I would give myself credit for. I don't think I had a, a wealth of natural ability, I've got to say, but I probably had grit looking back now. And, and that's taken me a long way on my journey. It's really interesting you mentioned, I actually had a, um, an episode, this was a while ago, where a lady mm. actually came in to talk about grit. Yeah. Where do you think that's come from for you? Because that's obviously something you had in you from a very yeah. early age. Is that coming from family life, mum, dad? Where do you think that's coming from? I, I think there's a combination of, of a lot of things. I, I've discussed this at length uh, with my wife, Carol, and, and we talk about leadership and, and that type of thing. And... Really, I th- I think there is, it's certainly nurture, you know, genetics play a big part in it. And I yeah. think what you're surrounded with, the influence you're bombarded with, and a big one, really big for me, is how you handle resilience. You know, when you get those setbacks, have you got the resilience to say, I'll show you? And when I look back over my life, we've all had knockbacks as, as human beings whether they be professional or personal it doesn't matter they they all come knocking at some given moment in our lifetimes and it's those people and that that can probably handle that embrace it and learn from it and and probably say 
I'll prove you wrong in many ways. You know, people have doubted me in time. You know, I've had school teachers come up to me and say, uh, unless you learn to kick with your right foot, you'll never be a professional. Right. Uh, little things like that that you remember. It's a throwaway line from a teacher when I was 12 years old. Yeah. But all of a sudden, those little things stick in your mind. Are you good enough? And people doubt you. Some people go under at that stage. There's certain individuals, I think, that, that say, I'll embrace that. I'll take it on board and I'll, I'll prove you wrong. And in many ways, if you're a professional sports person in any mm. discipline, you're going to face setback. Mm. Uh, and you had to deal with some setbacks on the world stage. We'll come on to some of those. Yeah. because. But it's interesting that there's that grit and that resilience and that determination. Yeah. Um, I was really excited that we were going to have this conversation. Obviously, I read the book. Mm. Well, this is such a trial, or is it? Look at that. I've almost marked the pages. You've done your homework. I've done well my homework. Done. But... This is really interesting because this tells me a lot about what I describe as the human doing. An incredible career. You know, yeah. I grew up watching you, you play football yeah. as well. I'm also really fascinated, and there are some little clues in here, Stuart, about the human being. Mm. If you don't mention football, who actually is Stuart Pearce? How would you describe you as Stuart Pearce, but uh, not as the footballer? Yeah. I, I personally don't think the footballer defines me. I, I see people in the street. We were down in the in the coffee shop, the yeah, bakery yeah. below here earlier, and people come up to me, and they just see Stuart Pearce, the footballer that Correct. they've seen play or, or follow or whatever. They don't overly know the correct me. There's someone who's very structured, um, I think, Someone who's a little bit rebellious. I'm, you know, I was drawn to the punk situation in the seventies, and so I've got a little. Well, you love bit your of, music as well, right? Exactly <laughs> that. Um, I, I almost champion the underdog a little okay. bit. There's, there's a little bit of that in me. I don't like unfairness, right. if you like. And uh, uh, yeah, I. How would I describe me? I, I think I'm honest, hardworking individual that. It's, it's pretty good if you put adversity in my direction. And also as well, I've learned about myself that I'm not a high flyer straight away. I, I don't sort of, I probably don't pick things up very quickly. It takes me time to get there. So if I'm, I was working with an Italian coach with England, Fabio Capello. And after the first day when I walked into his coaching meeting, he's talking Italian with his coaching staff. I think to myself, well... I've got to learn Italian. So straight away, I start to learn Italian. Okay. And after a year and a half or two years, I, I can pick up threads of it. But it doesn't come naturally. I, I sort of, I look up to people that, that pick up things very quickly and, and whatever. I'm not that way inclined. I know that I'll get there eventually. And it's a great mindset to have because I almost convince myself, whatever the task is in front of me, I will get there eventually. So any knockback on a short-term basis... Don't affect me one iota, to be quite honest with well, you. This is where that grit and determination is it, kicking in, isn't it? Yeah, as I you think say, so. you know, success leaves clues. Obviously, the focus for this show has, has always been on leadership. I've always been mm. fascinated by it. And just before we started recording, I said to you, you know, I've seen the, the very best of what people can offer. Yeah. And unfortunately, I've seen the very worst of Indeed. what people can offer within, you know, the criminal justice and, and, and the law enforcement arena. I also hear the term leadership mm. banded around all the time. And it's used a lot in football. Yeah. So whether that's the players, the coaches, the managers, pundits, commentators. And I've always been intrigued as to what does that really mean when it comes mm. to professional football? What, what are your thoughts as what does leadership really mean? I, and I'm oversimplifying in many yeah. ways, but what are your kind of your, your gut thoughts on that? Um, I, I probably it's best for me at this stage to go back and, and look. I Let me take you back to probably I think it was 2012. Yep. I was asked... I. I been perceived as a leader all my life because I've captained a few football clubs, I've captained my country, that type of thing. Um, and people perceive me as a leader. Now, I have never put that into words until 2013 okay. when I was asked by the FA, 2012-2013, I was asked by the FA to take the FA Cup um, to Afghanistan to do a troop visit. So right. three of us went to Afghanistan, okay. took the FA Cup, and as I was at Bryce Norton sat there waiting for the flight to take yep. me out to Afghanistan, um, uh, a commanding officer came up to me and said, would you mind, we've got a group of, of, of young soldiers that we're grooming for leadership, would you mind speaking to them about leadership? Right. And before I even thought about it, I said, yeah, I'd love to, no problem at all. So I sat on the aeroplane and I thought, what do I actually know about leadership? How can I put that into words? Yes. And... 
to actually get myself to a starting point at that juncture, I turned around to, to myself and said, what individual have I looked up to in my career and why? Yeah. So I ended up coming up with Brian Robson, who when I broke into the England squad in the 80s, he was the captain and probably carried England on his back for a decade. Okay. He was an England player, Manchester United captain and whatever. And I thought, what personal traits, not just footballing traits, what personal traits has he got and, and what one word probably summed him up? And the word I come up with was unselfish. Okay. And I think that word underpins leadership in in my world. Um, I always got the impression whatever he said to me on a football pitch or off a football pitch was for my good and the greater good rather than his own, his own good. So selflessness as well. That yeah. selflessness. Yeah. And for me, you, you can dress leadership up in many different guises and it's got, you know... Probably when I first started out in football, it was the loudest who beated their chest the most. Now it's maybe the more subtle type of leader, but it's the unselfish one. And, and leadership, for me, turns around and says, if you're going to lead, someone's got to follow you. Well, no well, followers, no leadership, no, exactly right? Exactly that. And, and I think people lose track of that when they're trying to lead and they send messages out that they're in it for themselves, maybe... 80% the group, but 20% themselves. I think people see through that very quickly. They'll follow for a certain length yep. of time, but after a while, they'll drop away because they say, this fella's in it, or this lady's in it for themselves in the long run. I think real leaders and proper leaders are actually in it for the group. They put the group first and put them, put them before themselves every time. And that's what leadership it means to me at a base level, at a first initial level. Gotcha. You said something which piqued my interest right away. You said that in the earlier years you were perceived as a leader. Mm. Did you ever ask or start to uncover what was it that were people were seeing or hearing in you where mm. you got that label of a leader? Um, I think it was, in my world as a professional footballer, yeah. it would be professionalism, how I conducted myself on and off a football pitch, right. drive, competence at, at the job I'd done, yep. potentially. Um what I stood for in many ways, you know, what, what we're, we've all, our badge of honour for all of us as human beings is what we stand for and how we conduct themselves and what words people associated with you and that unselfish tag. I'd like to think that people felt as though when they, I've captained them at various clubs or I've managed them or coached them, yes. that they looked at me and thought, you know what, he, he wants the best for me, not himself, you know, and that that is, I think that's really powerful. Let me come to, because obviously you've been asked about the, the penalty in the 1990 mm. on many occasions. And I don't want you to think, oh, no, here's that question ad nauseum again. But in all mm. of the attributes that you just spoke about, in some ways, these may have all been almost the DNA, the defining moments that took you to being able to deal with 1990, yeah. with the world on your shoulders uh, and having to even go up and take a penalty. Who even knows what that feels mm. like? But then the disappointment that you describe as well that you felt yeah. and almost you felt again that 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 element that you felt the the weight of the team and the weight of the country on you as well. Yeah. Just tell me a little bit how you dealt with that on a human level. Yeah. Not on a football level, but on a human level, taking into account what we've just spoken about. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the penalty in mind is you know 1990. We're in a semi final. Yeah. We've got one foot. In a World Cup final, the, I was the team had never ever done that on foreign shores before in their history. We had yeah. a manager that was a wonderful statesman and was about to retire. So at any given time, this was his last game in charge, who gave me my debut as well. So you've got all of that in Just the more mix. more weight. Exactly, more weight. <laughs> Throw to, the weight on Yeah, top. half a billion people on television looking. And... To be honest with you, it is probably the lowest ebb that I've ever had as as a, as a player, um, and probably one of the lowest ebbs I've ever had as a footballer. Uh, and I include management in there, managing yeah. the Olympic team, all of those things. And I think for me at the time, when it happened, you missed the penalty, that type of thing, you think, well, you're never going to recover. If you ask me the, the question walking back to the halfway line, you think, I'm not going to recover for this. Yeah. And it's amazing when you come away from scenarios and it's really raw at the time 
you, you probably doesn't you don't see the messages that are in there and it's not until you come away and it's a month later or a year later yeah. or whatever you look back you're on in the that. moment e- exactly yeah i look back i i went into the dressing room after that penalty miss and i was called into a drugs test uh myself peter shilton and two german players oh, went into i was going to ask room. you about this yes. yeah we literally went into a room Peter walked in, give a urine sample and left. So it, it left myself and two German players sat opposite each other. They didn't say a word. They just well, won a World Cup semi-final. I just lost a World Cup semi-final or missed a penalty to boot. And they didn't say a word to each other for the whole duration. Two hours we sat there together. And it, I didn't really think anything at the time. But when I look back now, I think the humility that they showed in success was quite incredible. And... That was a big driver for me, I think, going forward. Every time I've, I've had a success, I always look at the other side. For my success often means someone else's failure in the opposition's team. So let's say if you roll the clock on of six years from there, I scored a penalty against Spain. There was euphoria at Wembley in a European Championship. But a Spanish player missed a penalty for them to go out. Yeah. So when the England players are celebrating, my focus is on that Spanish player. And to get to him and commiserate with him because of my experience. And that's where you, you've you got to keep picking those good experiences from some of the worst moments in your life, to be quite honest with you. And if you can keep doing that, I, I think you keep striving forward because they're the strong messages in there. Success, when people come and pat me on the back for a great career, it, it, it's almost a resistance with me. It feels It doesn't feel good for right. some reason. When when you ha- when you suffer an adversity, I think it sharpens focus. You embrace it if you can. Sometimes you can't embrace it straight away. It might take a number of weeks, a number of days, yeah. a number of years. But there are great messages in there and great learnings. Now that's obviously important to you. That story. I know it was in the book, mm. and it and it immediately resonated with me. Yeah. And you've used a word that I actually I've got on the screen here was humility. Yeah. And it takes me back, I sometimes think of, I think it was Colonel Tim Collins when he was addressing the troops way back in the US and he said, we've got to be ferocious in battle and magnanimous in victory. Yeah. And here what stood out that those German players were showing you great humility, mm. <clears throat> which has had a huge impact on you. Indeed. And in some ways they were role modelling and you've now mirrored it in relation to the Spanish player that you spoke about. Indeed. But a lot of people wouldn't have picked that up on the day. They'd have probably sat there in commiseration with themselves, yeah. felt sorry for themselves, walked out of there, not seen that there was a, a brilliant understanding and a brilliant learning to be had from that to come away from it. And, I mean, you, you're talking about humility. I mean, it was fortunate fortunate enough in, in one of the leadership uh, speeches I've done at, at Sandhurst oh, right. to get the opportunity to go to Brunei to talk to a Gurkha regiment. I've done three wow. speeches to to the Gurkha, Gurkha regiment and the humility that these individuals show blew me away. It really did, you know. That, and I'm speaking with a commanding officer and I'm saying, what are the biggest problems you have dealing with these people? And they said, they don't question anything. They just literally do what's for us. It's incredible, them. isn't it? Incredible. Uh, and and some t- we need to get out of them. We need them to question us as leaders, so, to test us and make us better. I think, again, one of the reasons I really wanted to have this conversation is you've had many different roles, from the player mm. to the coach to the manager, the pundit, the captain. Yeah. Much of the conversations I have with people now, senior across sectors, is the rise of what I describe as human-centred leadership. Mm-hmm. And the more senior you become, perhaps the less you are relied upon for your expertise or your competence, but the more you're relied upon for your human-centered yeah. leadership. And humility is, is one. Yeah. Uh, and I've kind of identified seven components, but I won't rehearse them here. Let me talk to you about when you step into the role of the captain. How much is or are you relying on the competence and your ability to play the game? And how much is your team relying on you from that human-centered mm piece i think what you've spoke about there was a different potentially Stuart pierce back in those days when i was a player because you're very driven you're result driven you you you're driving yourself for performance all the time so you know as a captain you have to deliver a performance that is competent for your teammates for your self-esteem for everything to get a result for, for the whole group 
that's changed over time with myself. I, I almost, I finished a role at West Ham. I've been, I've been there on the assistant manager at West Ham. Finished there last summer. Had two years there. And every day I used to get in my car and I thought, how can I help everybody else? And there's there's been a marked difference. I'd like to say when I was a player, uh, you know, I, I, I used to help everyone. I, I probably right. did discreetly and, and covertly where I didn't realise, you right. know, and by how I conducted myself, young players looking at me, the level of professionalism, all of those type of things that probably went with me. Now I've softened a lot as an individual to come into the role that I, I probably operate in now yeah. where I really enjoy helping others, you know, whether it be going into companies and delivering messages that might help their company or coaching young players or, or a vast, you know, spectrum of... But the mentality is I've had a real, I think, personality shift in many ways. What would be kind of your best advice to some of the, the youngsters who, who I hope are listening and watching this in relation to setback? Mm. Because we're, we're all going to have to deal with setbacks and sometimes they can be cumulative. And, yeah. and they're, But, you know, kind of what's your, yeah. your advice to yeah, a lot of the younger generation who are going to hit these setbacks? Yeah, I, I went to a psychology course and, and this helped me out at times. I went to a psychology course when I was working for the FA in the early 2000s. Right. And, uh, I was quite impressed with a gentleman that, that, that was leading it. And he turned around and, and said, uh, if you've got a problem, quite often that problem is internally magnified rather than externally. And, and the example he gives, he said, if you're driving your car and someone cuts you up, they won't know about it. And you internally have got yourself into a stew, into a pickle and whatever. Yeah. Who's responsible for your mood at that stage? Yeah. And we all went into ourselves and went, well, well, it's us, obviously. He said, well, you're responsible. And then on the back of that, just recently, we come up with a statement. We were banding round myself and, and a friend of mine. We were banding round conversation about leadership, about resilience, that type of thing. And I turned around and said, basically, life's just an optical illusion. And he said, what do you mean by that? We all come across adversity at times, but it's how we perceive it. It's, it's an optical illusion. You could have the worst day of your life. Yeah. S one person would carry that with them for the next 10 years. The other person w would just brush it off and move on the next day. And I think I'm really good at departmentalising certain aspects that go on. Yeah. As in... Or ring fencing it almost. Exactly that. Push yeah. it What's away? the worst can happen? You know, I look at it like this. I missed a penalty in a World Cup semi-final. Well, it's not life-threatening, well, you know. It's about perspective, isn't perspective it? Perspective is everything. Where, where mm. did this vigilant... You, you, what you're also describing is being incredibly vigilant mm. about things that are happening around you yeah. and impact yeah. of your behaviour on others and others on you. Yeah. Where, where's that coming from? I think it's, a lot of it's coming with age and a lot of it's coming with experience. <laughs> right, okay. I'm sad to say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. Um I tell you what I think I'm for, one of my strengths is as well whenever I've I've sort of worked I call opinion right of those around me and I almost go to to any scenario whether I'm a coach whether I'm a manager or whatever and and, and my starting level is they know more than me okay and that for me is is the best way to be as a leader I think go to the party and say they all have got more knowledge well there's you. that humility kicking in again yeah I, I think i am very humble for what, what, why wouldn't i be yeah. you know simple as that but i i think there is that i'm been really fortunate in a lot of the uh the organizations i've worked for either in the england setup or club setup or whatever uh that i've surrounded myself with some really good people or there's been some really good people in the room that I'm quite happy to drop my guard, show my vulnerability yeah. and say to them, look, I don't know the answer, please tell me and get over the line as a team. You know, we sometimes call that, that was your personal boardroom, mm. that you've got, you've chosen some people around you who yeah. are, are critical friends and, and will give it to you yeah. honest. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways they're your, they're your sounding board. Yeah. Um, if I think about meaning in life, I know you, you've always been passionate about what you do, so you've yeah. always been passionate about football. And I think in the book you mentioned, you said that w when Gary Lineker retired, he was kind of like, well, I've got other things and the family focus. Mm. And, and and you said it felt different to you. Football felt almost like a huge meaning. Tell me a little bit about you know how you find meaning in things that you do. Um, I think we're all driven to certain 
levels to achieve. Yep. And and I I find that I'm I'm quite happy if people pat me on the back. My line managers pat me on the back. It it lifts me. I also uh, act to sometimes if. if individuals come and deliver some harsh words as well it's yeah. it's got the desired effect you know so um for me I, football's always and football's probably what i get remembered for the most yep. out in my life when i walk down the street if people bump into me they'll perceive that the individual that played on the pitch is the individual personality that's wise. the association that the, straight exactly away, right? that yep. and sometimes they misjudge you Sometimes, you know, you, you've got, oh, I didn't realise you were like that, or um, which is quite nice, actually, to surprise people. Um, and that's probably certainly the leadership work I, I, I do as well. You know, you walk into a room and there's probably 80% of people that love football yeah. and know my journey. But I'm without being blasé, I'm not interested in the 80%. I want the 20% yeah. that are sat in that room because their company have said we got a leadership speech today from from somebody that's been involved in football, yeah. and for them to come to me afterwards and said, "Well, well, there's a great challenge, isn't it? Because you've got to connect mm. with that twenty percent without them knowing the background history. Indeed, and Indeed. in some ways, it's almost a, a clean slate. So as you as we all progress in life, wisdom kicks in and opportunity kicks in. And if I think about um, you know your role as manager as well, so were there things that had happened to you that you had seen and experienced that you deliberately took into your manager role where you thought this is the person I need to be mm. this is how I'm going to get the best out of you know these young talented individuals what were kind of things on your mind that you thought I'm going to be very deliberate about this 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 as a manager now having had the playing career um I think what you do you, I there was never one individual and I've worked for some strong personalities as a manager Brian Clough being being probably yeah. you know a stand eight alone. years I think eight with, years with worth Brian yeah Clough. so it was incredible but there were certain individuals I worked with that I thought I wouldn't take what they've done. I wouldn't try to emulate them in any way, shape or form. But I think I've tried to take for good and for bad out of all individuals what I believed has worked, yes. what I believed has worked for me as well. What's, what's motivated me, what hasn't motivated me, why it did, why it didn't, and try to break it down. And, and what you've got to understand as well, what I probably didn't, didn't realise when as I just finished playing, the things that motivated me won't motivate the next clutch of young players that yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get a tune out of or get the best out of themselves. So, you know, for me, my motivation was playing for England and an England cap. So you couldn't pay me any amount of money to replicate what it meant to, to win an England cap. Yeah, The next young player might hold more reverence on earning his first million potentially, than winning an international cap. So I've got to make sure I get in tune with those, with their mentality and try and get the best out of them. Yeah, Almost, as they say, with their map of the world, more so than my map of the world. Now, that's interesting you said it. I had a, one guest who said that leadership is energy expensive. And I think the pandemic may have shown us all, and many people mm. in leadership, that you've now got to spend time to really connect stay connected or indeed reconnect mm. with people on a deeply human level how much time did you spend really getting to know all of the players so you could understand yeah. exactly what was motivating or uh, you know inspiring them or, or frightening them yeah that that's a very true statement getting to know getting to know individuals is everything in leadership for me um i probably in my early days if i put my hand on my heart i said probably I felt as though you had to do everything, lead from the front, yep. show whatever. The older I've got, the more, uh, as a potential leader, if you like, I've sat back and it's all. It's been more and more about others around me yeah. and and getting to know them. And quite often, um, strange little things. It's like I done a, a reality bear grills thing. Right. Right. Okay. And there was twelve of us on that. And uh, as you do with every everyone this day and age, you go on your Wikipedia, your Google, and YouTube. All the individuals. Everyone checking everyone else. Exactly. Out. So uh, I'm going away with a group of people, some actors, some this, some that. And uh, I've got to say, I I prejudged an individual called Jason Gardner because he was one of the judges on ice dancing or something. And he was a really stern judge, and yep. I saw a, a miniature clip of him on YouTube, right. and I thought. Before I go and meet up with this individual, I've got a preconceived idea of what he's like, and I'm not sure I like what I've seen. Okay. So I thought, the first thing I'm going to do is go up to him and get to know him. 
and I went up to him at Heathrow Airport when we were about to fly out to South Africa. Yeah. And I engaged him in conversation, went out his way. We're all 12 individuals that most don't know each other. One or two probably did. I didn't know anyone there on a personal level. Right. And I went out of my way to meet the ones that I thought I have absolutely nothing in common with. Nothing at all. And we got on brilliantly. Honestly, and it taught me a really valuable lesson about prejudging, going into things. And as luck happens, I went out of my way to to find that out about myself, okay. you know. So that's really important. Well, there's that curiosity, I think, that, that yeah. I'm hearing as well. I, I'm I'm really intrigued now about your role as a pundit. Mm. I know you're doing uh, talk sport a lot, and you're, yep. you're off to Manchester uh, tomorrow for the match. Mm. And so I'm interested now with all of the experiences that you've had and with all of that wisdom the take that you've got on some of the issues in the mm. game now. So, for instance, managers, the carousel, I think, have we lost, what, 10 Premier yep. League managers already this season? Yeah. Uh, I'm a slightly battle-scarred Watford fan, mm -hmm. where it seems that managers yeah. are... In. Tell me a little bit about what's the answer. Is there an answer to managers for Premier League football at the moment? So I'll give you, for instance, I meet a lot of CEOs of businesses who are not from the sector that they're leading yeah so you don't have to be an airline pilot to run uh, an airline industry you don't have to be a medic to run a healthcare industry do people need to come from football to run a football team i don't think so no i i think uh the experience that it gives you can be helpful yep. at times walking into dressing rooms can be helpful at times yep. in regard to the group that you're in front of will look at you and what you stand for. Yes. For good and for bad, by the way. I bet. Well, uh, there's the judging kicking in again, yeah. right? But the one thing I haven't got, um, because I'm involved in football at the sharp end, I've not got a fresh set of eyes from the outside. I can never have that because I've been involved. So if I'm a football manager, um, I only ever go in with a perception and you know, a map of the world that I've got through years of being in, involved in football. Sometimes you need outside influences. I have um, I enjoy going into other environments, other sporting environments and whatever. Yep. I, I asked when I was at West Ham as a coach, I asked a rugby league coach who's a friend of mine to come in and spend four days, just have a wander around, yep. give me feedback, A, on my performance and B, on what he's seen around the environment. And... That's something I couldn't do. I could be in that environment, but I've I've got all the th all the things that have bombarded me over my career. You want that external perspective, exactly that. Yeah. And I think that is is so refreshing. That's why if you say to me, do you have to be involved in football, or could you be outside? I think you could quite comfortably be from outside our profession. Yes, and maybe even get a better perspective on on where we are at this moment. Why do you do things like that? Well, because we've always done it like that, you know. A lot of organisations come up with that, can that you, sort of statement. Can you see a time when a, a, a big household name team goes with a, 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 almost a, a, an evidence leader, but mm. not within football? Because you can imagine how difficult that is from a fan and a player perspective. Yeah. Again, as you say, from the credibility yeah. perspective. Can, could you see a time that would that could happen? I don't see any reason why not. Right. I certainly uh, I managed Manchester City as, as my first major managerial role, and I bought outside people in yep. to a look over our organization from from a, from outside basically psychologists i had inside working with us that have got no footballing background but they could give me that fresh set of eyes that i haven't got and my group of staff didn't have so it sounds like you're always maybe going to have that person who's the specialist in football but there's a cadre of people behind them i who think are going so. to bring that yeah. that external perspective um I want to ask you another question. I heard you chatting about it on, on Talk Sport, and I know you're, you're a referee as well. That's correct. I'm a qualified referee. Qualified from referee. Years ago. Yeah. So we do a lot of work within leadership about mindset and behaviours. Mm. I reckon the, the, the vast majority of the work that I do is helping large global organisations decide what are the mindsets and behaviours they need, what are the capabilities they need in their people in order to make the strategy true. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're here at a point in time, they want to be somewhere else in three years. Yes. What, what do we need from a people point of view to make that happen? And when we wrote the book with TPI, there was a very simple premise. It was this, is as you believe, so you behave, and as you behave, so you perform. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer, Stuart, in role modelling. And you've given us, you know, you've talked about people that you've seen where you've had an impact on people role modelling to you and then you've role modelled that as well. Mm. 
One of the things that's played out recently, and we've seen this with Fernandez and Mitrovic, is now hands on the referee. Mm. And in some ways, there's a mindset there, isn't there? That either that's appropriate, either that nothing's going to happen, then there's a series of behaviours, and then it trickles down because there's the role modelling piece into yeah. maybe grassroots football. What are you seeing at the moment? What are your thoughts just in relation to that whole mindset and behaviours on the pitch? And and really that requirement now maybe to, I don't know, in some ways elevate the responsibility of the referee. Long question, I know, but you know yeah. what I mean? This, yeah, is, a, this is a, an yeah. interesting... I, I think for me, we football itself has to empower the referee a little bit more, yep. back the referee a little bit more. Um to try and arrest what I'm seeing in football. Because I, I can honestly tell you, I'm a big fan of rugby league. I'm a Warrington Wolves fan. Yeah, I go I up to watch rugby league and I watch the respect for the referee, the respect for each other on the pitch. It's the a players. stark difference, isn't it, it between the two? It's literally that. And the, the players uh, going around the perimeter of the pitch afterwards, win or lose, by the way, you know, taking photos with young players and all that. And I look with pride and watch that. Football at times, I'll go and I'll, I'll know I'll go to a game tomorrow or Tuesday, whenever it may be, and I'll see players feign at, feigning injury, yeah. old time wasting, this, that. And it frustrates me as an ex player, it really does. That I, I think it's not how I want things to be perceived as footballers. I don't think it sends out a great message to young players. And I think the respect for the referees at this moment in time from the players is at a level where. These type of things happen yeah. in regard to you're talking about Mitrovic and yeah. whatever handling the referee. Yes, because I I think every time the referee would go out and make a decision, they're under a microscope that much that any one. De- I think they've done a survey. They they've taken their their correct decisions analysis from ninety six percent to ninety eight. The referees right. this season. You tell me an organisation anywhere <laughs> exactly. in the world, whether it be sport or business, that can deliver a 98% correct uh, decision. With that pressure. With exactly that. And we've just got to start back in our referees, turn the spotlight away from the referees and turn it on the players and their action and subsequently start dishing out punishments that are going to re- reflect the way we want the game to go. Do you think we're at a point in time at the moment because of recent events where this could go in one of two directions? Because, you know, we talk about creating culture, you permit and promote yeah. the culture that you get. So are we at a point in time where we've had some instance of this nature? You and others have been vocal about it. You know, you've got a pretty strong moral compass. Mm. Do you think we're at that point where this could go in one of two directions? Uh, I don't. I, I, th- I think in, in many ways this is isolated. Cause yep. this. Is, is something you don't see. I mean, this is a very rare coincidence. Prior to this, I think it was De Canio was the last time I saw someone put their hands on It's just on a brought referee. it to the surface again, Exactly, it? Yeah. and it highlights it. But one is too many, you know, mm. and it's not just handling of a referee. It's you, you can see what's coming out of players' mouths on television, swearing at referees, and referees seem to accept it now because they've been backed into a corner. Yeah. They've got to be backed by the Football Association, Referees Association, and the powers that be to empower them as individuals to make decisions knowing full well they're going to get backed afterwards. You put, Look in any workplace. If you're going to send your staff out there and empower them to make decisions, if every time they make a decision for themselves, you start beating them when they come back with that decision, eventually they're not going to make a decision. You know, So that's what we've got to do with referees, like any good business would, empower people to make their own decisions. But when they do, if they get the odd one wrong, you're there to support them, not hang them out to dry. And, and in many ways, it trickles down, does it? Because we talked about grassroots football and mm. the challenges there. So like any organisation, in some ways, what goes on at the top then starts to trickle down Indeed. And, and, and is role modelled there. Um, I forgot to ask you a question because I know you're a big, you're a big music fan as mm. well. And I wanted to ask you about the impact of that now iconic song uh, of the three lines <laughs> but mm. back in 1996. Um, I mean, I'm not saying you have to be a music fan, but what kind of impact sometimes do external forces have on you and your mindset and your performance? And, and just using that as an example, when that, that came out, I think I read somewhere where when you first heard it, you had a bit of a preview. You thought, oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But then it kind of got momentum. Yeah. What was the impact? I think it's this. I mean, music's 
played a massive part in my life yeah. as a 14 year old in 1976 the punk explosion involved in that loved it to bits and that music has stayed with me to this day yes um we ended up as they often do with big tournaments um Deal and Skinner and the Lightning Season put a single out and, and that was it, three yeah. lines. And they come to our hotel where the England team were and they put a stereo on the side and put it on. And, Bloody imagine. And I'm thinking, well, what, this is awful. But I'll tell you what, when we got involved in the tournament itself at Wembley, yeah. 100,000 people singing it as an anthem, wow. Even today, if I got in my car now and heard it, the hairs on the back of my neck would stand up because it evokes memories, and yeah. that's what music does. Every time I hear a, a track from, from yesteryear, if you like, it evokes a memory of where you were then potentially or a memory that goes with that. And Three Lions is one of those. It, it throws up for me the camaraderie we had, the togetherness of the nation, the feel-good factor, everything that football should uh, all the good things that football should stand for were there that were underpinned by everyone in Wembley Stadium singing that song. Imagine, yeah. It was incredible. I bet no one probably uh, foresaw that happening, I reckon, when they probably did. I can imagine them putting the stereo on the, the yeah, seat it, almost, playing it, and all of you lot thinking, this is going nowhere. And, it, well, and well then, <laughs> your typical football song, yeah. but my goodness me. He, he, as I say, even now, if, if I hear it now, it just takes me back to, to the summer of 96 and, and everything that went with it. No, it's incredible memories. Listen, I'm, I'm also passionate about youngsters now coming through the mm. ranks of, of every discipline a couple of weeks ago i had four young leaders in here and they were really uh vocal and quite explicit about what they wanted from a culture yep. and the leaders of today and that they really wanted personalized leadership um my son was in in the academy system for four years it was an interesting experience for him but thinking about the academy system that we've got mm. and, and youngsters coming through yeah, you know, again, with with all of your experience, what are some of the advice that you you would give now to the academy system or even those organisations who are trying to really give young people the best chance at whatever they want to do, the dreams that they have? You know, kind of what's front of mind for you? Um, if if I was giving advice to a young player or even a young person yeah. in a business environment, um, for me, the, the three the three things as a player: eat, sleep, and train better than the person you're playing against. Basics. But every time you need to check yourself, you go eat, sleep and train. Have I ate better than the person I'm playing against? Have I slept better? Have I trained better? They were the three tags that I, I worked to as a player. Yep. I would say to young players, play for the enjoyment of it. Take ownership of your own career. Yeah. Now, whether that is as a footballer or in business, yeah. you're the product of, of what you sow. And the big one for me, this is this is... Absolutely massive. And this probably has opened so many doors for me in, in my life. Word of mouth. If you think that the outside world are not going to talk about you and make a phone call before they employ you, you're probably deluded. Right. Especially in football. We work with somebody. If I want to sign anybody, first thing I do is pick up the phone to somebody who's worked with that individual and say, what are they like as a person? Not their professional, how good they are at their job, how qualified they are, all of those things. I'll probably know that. I can see that with my own eyes. What they like as a person. And that will either open a door for you or slam it shut in your face and you won't even know about it. Do you know what? That reminds me of Adrian Simpson coming a few... He talked about Southwestern Airlines mm. and they have got an incredible recruitment process that actually before you even get to the interview, yep. they will have backtracked and spoken to the airline you were on the taxi you were in, they would have arranged all of this Indeed. and spoken to everybody to say, tell me about yeah. that person. Yeah. How were they with you? How did they treat mm. you? How did they react? And if there's any negative feedback, you don't even make it to the interview. So again, it's about that, yeah. that human being, not the human yeah. doing. See, I'm not surprised by any of that. That that should That is the first thing that is out there as you as a person. Yeah. You're permanently on interview. Your life is an interview. You bump into, I bump into somebody down there in the bakery. If I'm rude to them, he'll tell a... 10 people today. Well, that's it. It's ingrained. That That is his or her perception mm. of, of Stuart Pearce will be yeah. that single experience, within tech, which, which is difficult, isn't it, in many ways, because you're being assessed by so many people based mm. on what they know, what they think they know. Yeah, but which is fine. But that would be my advice to, to any youngsters out there foraging their way in life. And I think work ethic as well. I, I 
I come across a, a brilliant, brilliant statement from uh, Gary Kasparov and uh, the, the chess yeah, world yeah, champion. Chess, yeah. And they asked him the question, what, what was the difference between good and great? And like, I thought to myself, well, he's got to say, you know, game understanding, uh, knowledge, all of those type of things that I associate yep. with chess. And the one thing he turned around, he said, the great have the talent of hard work. And this is a chess world champion in, in a sport that is, is all in the mind, mm. you know. And he talked about hard work and practice. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really powerful stuff. And I think we, we write off hard work at our peril, I think. People think it's just a byproduct. It isn't. You know, we talk about, we revere knowledge, we revere understanding, we revere decision making. But hard work, we, well, we, he works hard. Well, I'm going to get my son to listen to this episode, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> now, we're coming towards the end now, but can I just ask you, here's a bit of a bit of fun, but rapid fire round with kind of either or. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a couple of options, you tell me, no and problem. it will give us an insight into you as well. So PC or Mac? It's neither. I'm, I'm incompetent. That's why I surround myself with people that are far better. With and, and I'm is being that right, Carol? Is it the, right? The people are nodding at me, which is Ab great. On, absolutely not. If I'm doing a presentation, Carol does it. I'll deliver the verbals. Carol delivers the technical side of it. Literally, well, Carol. We're going to have to get you in as well on that. I think on the book or movie. Uh, movie. Football or rugby? Now Foot that's not as silly as it sounds, is it? It's not. It's a tough one. Uh, Football's my job now. It's, oh, it's got to be football. It's got to be football. <laughs> but I know you love yeah. the rugby as well. Oh, this one makes me... Simon Jordan or Jim White? <laughs> That's tough. Simon. Uh, be loved or be feared? I think be loved. Be feared before I was 40. After 40, be loved. <laughs> okay. Uh, sweaty or freezing? I'd rather be freezing. I could hear. Were you? I know. It's. Oh, I feel like. Do you remember Mr. and Mrs. Where you, if you say an yeah. answer, and I'm looking to see where, where it's that remote work or face to face? Face to face. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, I love this one. Time travel, twenty years back or twenty years forward. Real tough one there. Twenty. Year, I think. I think I'd have to go forward. Okay. Breakfast or dinner. Breakfast is the first one. Get it under your belt. Uh, leader or follower? Yeah, leader for me. Yeah, which I, which is why it leads me into kind of my final question. Yeah, with with all it being, it's been great to chat to you. With everything that you've experienced and the work you're doing, especially in the leadership space. Yeah. What's the best piece of leadership advice you've ever given or received? Uh, wow. I find that really difficult to answer. To be fair. Whilst, whilst it's not great leadership in its truest form, because of who delivered it, yeah. it had a brilliant, brilliant desired effect. I got picked to play for England for the first time, and Brian Clough, my manager, I was right. his captain, 25 years old at the time, called me into his office. And I walked in, he said, take a seat. And then he said, I see you've been picked for the England squad, son. I said, that's correct. He said, do you think you're good enough? I said, I'm not sure. He went, I don't get out. <laughs> and that, for me, it sharp. I was nervous as a kitten to represent England. Bear in mind, three and a half years earlier, I was an electrician for the council. Right. To go and represent England, the, f the next game coming up was against Brazil, 100,000 at Wembley, stepping into an environment that, that if you're not nervous, there's probably something wrong with you. And he delivered those words to me. A, keep your feet on the floor. And, and secondly, he probably didn't think I was good enough. And he changed my mindset there and then with, with that word. And that was word for word, th that conversation. He changed my mindset from someone nervous about an international career to someone that had something to prove and a cause to rebel against. And that was brilliant for me. That whether you call that leadership or whatever you call it, it had the desired effect. I remember every word of it like it was yesterday. Yeah. And because it was delivered from by him, um, it had such a desired effect. And for me, it was brilliant. I, I went on, instead of turning up, being nervous about the occasion, all I could think about was, I'll show you. 
Well, there you go. I didn't even ask any questions about Cluffy, so it's quite nice we got that mm. story in. Finished. Listen, you've been an absolute superstar. Thanks very much for My coming pleasure. on the show. Has it been good fun to talk about leadership more than anything else? Well, to be fair, that's what inspires me now. I, I, I love leadership. I love going into varying different companies, sports teams, yep. whatever it may be, and delivering messages and try and get in tune with them. I, I just really enjoy it. It, it, it it, it almost it, it fulfills me now where f- where football used to many years ago. Yeah. This does now. And well, it kind of leads me to a last last question. I, I promise. Uh, you, know, you love football. This is what you do, mm. uh, and it, it's kind of instinctive and automatic. What's next for you then? Um, I, I would like to build uh, a decent portfolio of, of going into companies uh, yep. uh, and be renowned if you like or be as good as i possibly can uh, someone that can div- deliver leadership motivation to companies or, or or sports teams whatever it may be that people turn around and say you know what he come in walk through our doors he, he understood our business and he really helped me to help me with my everyday work yeah. whether it be for a leader a group of leaders or even someone on the factory floor basically you know that's going to help them they're still leading in a way yeah, aren't they leading indeed so Stuart, it's brilliant. Thank you so much My indeed. Pleasure. Safe journey up to Manchester. And uh, I look forward to sharing this episode with you. Lovely job. Take great care. Thank you. Cheers. Join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the leadership enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com. Powered by Transform Performance International where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.